Hi, everyone. Welcome to a very special episode of Foundation Radio. Uh, my name is Adam, which you already know. Um, initially, we were planning on bringing you the Breakfast Meet-Off Super Showdown, and we were working on some different things like Dungeons & Dragons 2 and a couple of different things we aren't really allowed to talk about. Um, and then things changed, uh, and we kind of got together as a group, and we decided that it was a, a good idea uh, to probably postpone uh, a bunch of our stuff, our bunch of our in-person recording stuff, at least for the time being. Um, this coronavirus has kind of taken over everything, and it's made everybody really uneasy. It's made everybody uh, kind of panicky, kind of worried. And we decided that it was in the best interest of us uh, collectively and individually to probably hold off on doing anything, uh, at least for now. We don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, you know, my kids are home now at least for two weeks. Um, I'm still going to the city. Uh, I'm still working. Uh, so we're trying to just make everything work right now. Uh, but anyway, uh, I wanted to think of a way to still continue to deliver content to everybody who's listening, and we appreciate everyone who's listening to us, and we appreciate all all listens we get, and everyone that talks about us. It's really quite exciting, and we thank you. But I wanted to dig into the archives a little bit and come up with something that maybe I thought would uh, bring some ease and some comfort to anyone. Um, Greg and I, in 2012, we got to interview Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson when we were on WCUR. Uh, we interviewed him with Jake Summers, who's a great friend of the show. And it was really quite a cool experience. It took about six months for us to get everything together and to put it all in in, in the works and get the wheels moving. Uh, went through a couple different publicists, and it was around the time that his book Space Chronicles came out. And uh, it's still amazingly, you know, even eight years later, this interview has held up really, really well. A lot of the stuff that he talks about is very, very um, pressing today, um, especially with things like NASA and, you know, some of the other things he talks about. He tells a really fun story about Pluto and, you know, why he doesn't care about Pluto being demoted as a planet. And uh, yeah, it's just a really great interview. It was a lot of fun to talk to him. Uh, it was, it was a, you know, a dream from a long time. Um, you know, it's kind of a... Uh, a marquee item for Greg and I to do, uh, especially when we were in college, and I felt like right at the end of my college career, it was my last big thing that I did, and I was excited to uh, to to do it. Uh, it was a lot of fun, and I'm I'm really proud of this interview. So I wanted to share this with you. Uh, and if you've never heard it for the first time, it's really you know I hope you enjoy it. And if you've heard it again, this will be the second time you've heard it or the third time. I hope you enjoy it still. So uh, without further ado, here is Foundation Radio's interview with Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our guest today. He's the world's most recognizable astrophysicist. He's also the director of the Hayden Planetarium and a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History. His new book, Space Chronicles, is available right now. You can recognize him from the Nova Science Now show on PBS. Also, Real Time with Bill Maher, The Colbert Report, and countless other appearances. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. How you doing, sir? Good to talk to you. Yes. You have three people there applauding. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I heard you called this morning uh, before I came into the studio, and I, I have to be honest with you. I was about as giddy as a, uh, a teenage girl waiting for a phone call from the Jonas Brothers. I was just so... <laughs> I was so excited to have you on the air, and uh, we're I'm just, curious how you actually know what that feels like. I, I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you I'm go. not really sure. I don't think I should answer that. <laughs> but uh, let's get right into it. Um, you know, your new book, Space Chronicles. It's a collection of interviews, essays, and uh, there's a couple poems in there um, about the from the course of your career dealing with the issue of space exploration. It seems yeah, as it's every thought I've ever had about our past, present, and future in space. It's it's right. really a fantastic read. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's I read it in about three days. It's really very good. It seems that the biggest question in your book is about what happened to the dream of the country um, exactly wh where do you think they went what do you think happened well so here's the problem well here's the challenge in the, our golden era of space exploration of course that was the apollo era what motivated that is what we all forget what motivated it was that we were at war with russia right. sputnik gets launched did you know that sputnik that spacecraft was the shell of an intercontinental ballistic missile but with the warhead removed and they named it Sputnik, which means fellow traveler, and they put in a little radio transmitter that went beep, beep. And so to the <laughs> average person just tracking it, it's, oh, isn't that nice? But to the military folks, it was, whoa. Right. They can, they can, you know, if it, it doesn't have a warhead today, but it could have a warhead tomorrow. So within a year, uh, we founded NASA. And so the motivation for us to go into space was never to explore. It was never to the, the original driver. It was never for all of these lofty goals. It was to beat the Russians. And so, so meanwhile, even though we're at war with Russia, it's still a glorious adventure. 
And so that's the part of it that we remember. And so when we get to the moon and we learn that Russia was had was really never going to get to the moon at that point, right, right. we stopped going to the moon. And when you realize it as a military adventure, it's obvious why we stopped going to the moon. But for those who saw it as the next natural thing for humans to do, it's in our DNA, then they cry foul and say, why didn't we continue to Mars? Right. So the whole history of this is a mismatch between people's expectations and what actually happens because they're deeply seated delusional thinking throughout the entire period. Now, now I know you, you brought up Sputnik, and that kind of leads me into my next question. You, you talk in the book about we lack this Sputnik moment right now, um, you know, especially what happened in the 1960s with the space race and everything that we had just said. But uh, do you think the, that these developing countries that are working, like China and, and um, Israel and Iran, I mean, do you think they're going to provide another moment like that to give us a Sputnik moment? I think we're already living through a Sputnik moment. Our economy is fading while the economies of other nations are rising. Nations whose economies we would have never imagined would be surpassing ours or competing with ours. Right. Never as in the past decades, of course. And so, so the Sputnik moment, as uh, uh, President Obama announced a year ago's State of the Union address, he, he, he rightly recognized that we're being out-competed, out-educated, out-manufactured. This is a cultural Sputnik moment. My great disappointment in his State of the Union address, again, this is a year ago's State of the Union, was he says, it's a Sputnik moment, here's what we need to do. And so I'm ready for that next big adventure that's going to be announced. And he says, okay, we need high-speed rail. Okay, we need energy independence. We need everyone with access to the Internet. And I'm saying, is that your Sputnik moment? <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> that should have happened anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what you want to accomplish here? I don't, yeah, I mean, we, you know, I mean, that should have been, I don't invoke Sputnik to accomplish that. That's a, that's a given. That, don't, you know, and so, so here's the thing. Back then we went... We were driven by war, but the economy benefited greatly for reasons that are not often written about. We benefited greatly because of the cultural shift in our sense of ourselves, in our capacity to think about what tomorrow means to ourselves. And the people who bring tomorrow into today are the scientists and engineers and technologists. And so when that is your culture, you are in a culture of innovation. And when you innovate, jobs don't go overseas because they don't know how to go overseas, because the overseas people haven't figured it out yet. All this talk today about jobs going overseas, that's, that's the fallout of the fact that we're not innovating. Not because, you know, we, we cry foul, oh, they're paying their workers less. If we innovated, it wouldn't matter what they paid their workers. They wouldn't know what we were doing because right, we'd right. be so far ahead of them. Absolutely. Now, I know it's, it's funny you mentioned Pres President Obama with, you know, the, the, the talk about the high-speed rails. Um, his budget cut, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is, this, these are the numbers that I read. The budget cuts for NASA overall are going to roughly equal a compromise of their budget uh, by about 38.5%, which is e an enormous number. Um, that means that most of the funding for a lot of these Mars missions that we're doing is uh, they're going to be halted, and, and all of the ideas that we have about going to the moon are just out the window. Do you think there's a, a specific reason as to why NASA is being targeted the way they are for their cuts, or do you think it's just a lack? Lack of uh, a lack of interest with the American people and, and the politicians in general. Okay, so I have, to, uh, I have to fix a couple of things that you said. Okay, so first, the, the NASA, the larger that thirty-eight but thirty-something percent that you mentioned, mm -hmm. that cut relates to the fact that we're not sending, continuing to send shuttles into space. Oh, okay. So All right. if you take that out of the budget, now you have to look at what remains. Now, what remains also had some cuts and some redistributions of monies within the science portfolio. And the cost of that was that the, J the famous James Webb Space Telescope that sort of follow on from the Hubble does get the extra funding that it needed at oh, the cost okay. of other projects that were in place. For example, the planetary program gets hit. Well, you know, Earth and Mars align every two years for a good orbital trajectory. And the, 19, the 2016 cycle and the 2018 cycle will have no missions to Mars. So the entire planetary science community, this just happened last week, is up in arms about this. And so, and I think rightly so, where they're fighting for pennies on an adventure that's helped define who we are as Americans in this, in this century. So, so I have deep concerns about people thinking that NASA is just some luxury of scientists when everybody you've ever spoken to has a Hubble picture on this as a screensaver on their computer. Looked at some of these photographic images and have bask in their majesty without even having to read the caption of what it was they were looking at. I can tell you for a fact that I have a, uh, a picture of a horse head nebula 
uh, as my background on my on my laptop and my home computer, and and I I just feel like I I feel like there's a lot of lost energy with with things it, like this. It's the horsehead nebula. The horsehead nebula. Okay. I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> okay. Greg, Greg, I was going to correct him, but I said I'll let that one. Uh-huh. Greg, I got it first. Greg, Greg, uh, Greg is our resident geologist in the field here, so yes. he uh, he's been helping me all day prepare for these uh, these questions, and so I don't sound like a total jackass. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, Doctor Tyson, um, I, I know as a taxpayer, and most of our listeners are taxpayers. Uh, can you help us to understand? exactly how much tax dollars go to NASA. I, f- I just find it very interesting how much really goes into NASA from a dollar of my paycheck. Yeah, so that's an excellent uh, question. So so one way I like to think about it is if you hold up the dollar, you know, a, a single you know, George Washington dollar bill, and you slide a, ni- a scissor along the bottom and say, where do you have to cut from left to right across that bill to equal sort of the fraction of that dollar that goes to NASA? And so the fraction is one half of one percent of that dollar. So you, when you cut off wow. the left edge, you, you're not even into the ink of the bill. <laughs> wow. Okay, Jeez. That's wow. Like, so that's fact one. Fact two. So so it's small. That one half of one percent pay for the space station and the space shuttles and the Hubble telescope and the rovers and all the astronauts and all ten NASA centers. One half of one percent. What's what what's remarkable to me is that the people who imagine NASA getting a much bigger budget would have never considered that it was that small. And the fact that people think NASA's budget is large is evidence that NASA must be doing something right. Absolutely. Because that's, it's the visibility of every dollar spent is extraordinary. It's probably the most visible money spent in the country. No. And so, so, now, so, so the real exercise here is not even how much NASA is getting, but what is NASA getting compared with other activities? The uh, common concern is, why are we spending money up there and not down here? We have real social pr- problems and issues down here. Okay, let's look at the budget for social issues. You do that, you add up all the social programs and education, that, that money we spend on social programs and education, it is 50 times the, the NASA budget. Wow. 50 wow. times. So, so what, do you want to zero NASA and hand it over to this other chunk of money and believe that somehow that's going to transform society? No. No. <laughs> yeah. You, you live in a like country where point. your portfolio of spending accommodates the needs of the country on, on, on all fronts. So you're going to give money to art because, as has once been said, if you're fighting a war and you say, well, do you give money to the war effort or to the art? Well, you want to remind yourself what it is you're fighting for. <laughs> okay. Right, right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Have a reason to do it. Yeah, Have a, just... There's a reason to do it right. it's because we do these great things. And so, so but my, my biggest point in all of this is the there's a cultural shift when a nation embarks on a major adventure of discovery and, and, and exploration. And that cultural shift in modern times has a direct impact on our creativity, uh, on, on our scientific and engineering creativity, and that's what drives the economics of the next century. Other countries know this, and we've been fading because we've forgotten it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with you. Do you think if there's a conscious effort to get the public rallied around space exploration again, do you think that NASA would, would become less of a political football and more of a true American reality? Yeah, exactly. Once we, att- once we recognize it as part of our American identity, then it transcends politician. It transcends, it transcends flu- uh, political winds. It would even transcend economic upturns and downturns because we would recognize it as the most effective and efficient investment in our economic future. Once you've done that, the two things my read of history showed me that there are two great drivers of great things that civilizations have done. One of them is war, the I don't want to die driver, and the other one is wealth, I don't want to die poor, right? And mm-hmm. so, yep. uh, and while it takes a couple of steps to make the argument, it is nonetheless a strong argument to, to, to say that when we are embarking on great adventures, we are stimulated to creative thinking, and we start dreaming about tomorrow. And all the tomorrows we dream are greater than the tomorrow than, than the todays that we live. And back in the golden era of space exploration, everybody was thinking about tomorrow, Tomorrowland, the city of tomorrow, the, the transportation. Tomorrow was in our reach. Even some of those old school posters that they have and, and, and advertisements. I mean, you see them in, the, in Back to the Future with the you know the um, the suburbs, the, the the vision of tomorrow, even things like that. I mean, the I life of tomorrow. Exactly. I can't even think of a time where I've ever in my lifetime seen anything close to uh, you know anyone dreaming or anyone having these. It ideas all stopped. Anymore. It all right. stopped, and it coincided with our expanding the space frontier. Now, over the past several decades, we've had the space shuttle. Which, which, which expanded an engineering frontier as it constructed the space station. And that's an, it's a remarkable piece of zero-G hardware. But it does not deny the fact that the space shuttle 
was boldly going where hundreds had gone before. It was not advancing a space frontier, and the concern about apathy, about our, our presence in space, derives directly from the fact that we were not advancing that frontier. I assure you that if we send astronauts back and are going places that no one has gone before, that would be headlines every single day until they arrive. Oh, absolutely. And we'd be, and we'd be wondering what school teachers did they have as kids and what made them on that as brave as they are on those missions. And then they come back and we build statues to them. That's what our culture has done forever. We honor those who explore and who risk their lives to learn something new, to go places that no one has gone before. That, that's the kind of environment, the kind of zeitgeist, the kind of mindset that prevailed in the 1960s. That's when we had the World Fair, for goodness sake, that was so widely written about because of its, uh, how it thought about tomorrow. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's, it's speaking of tomorrow and, and all these ideas, and you, you mentioned this, and I, I really got excited because I'm a huge Star Trek fan. Um, you said, to boldly go where no man has gone before. And in your book, you give an ode to Star Trek. Uh, it's towards the end of the book. But um, do you think that Gene Roddenberry was ahead of his time by about 40 years, or do you think it was more like several thousand? I mean, what, what do you think the cultural impact of a show like Star Trek at that time while the space race was going on and the way it came out, and even so much as to say the first motion picture um, with the Voyager concept and that, and that tie-in, I mean, do you... How, how culturally important and uh, to, to the rest of these ideas was Gene Roddenberry and, and his views on space exploration and human life? Yeah, great, great question. I, Gene Robert, Roddenberry was an important cog in a large wheel that was being turned by the visions of, of, of Stanley Kubrick in 2001. There were other movies of that era, like Marooned. There was Journey to the Far Side of the Sun. These were seriously uh, thought out uh, uh, space-based science fiction films exploring different uh, challenges and risks and, and, and joys of what that enterprise involved. What distinguished Star Trek, uh, by my read of that series compared with others, is how it used the space frontier as a way to reflect social issues back on us. And take a look at some of the themes of, those, of that storytelling. So I think its greatest strength wasn't simply that they showed modern trappings of, of medicine and, and, and analysis and planet visits and, and galaxy hopping, but that there, we, could, we could learn about ourselves in this, in this new kind of context. And I think that was its strength above all else. Uh, Gene Roddenberry deeply understood the human condition. And by the way, I, if, I, if I confess to you... Sure, absolutely. <laughs> so there they are on this ship. And I saw it you know, almost in real time when it came out. I'm, I'm that old. <laughs> and, um, and there they are on a ship in the 21st century crossing the galaxy. And th they walk up to the doors, and the doors open. And I say... Oh, that can never happen. <laughs> At the time, the door did not open for you. And, and I said, how does the door know he's there? What, what's that? And, and I, I was in denial of that, but somehow accepted the spaceship. Uh, that's, I, I confess that. You, you mean to tell me that we're going to have talking boxes that we can communicate with each other with? <laughs> no, I was, I was, I was, no that was, I was okay with that. I was yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> oh, just the sliding doors. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> well that's okay. <laughs> And we do have sliding doors, and they don't even go whoosh. I was just going to say, it's, silent. It, it's, that, it's the new technology. Yeah. Um, the, 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 there was something uh, that, that we mentioned, Adam just mentioned it, uh, when the motion picture came out, Star Wars, you know, of, uh, not Star Wars, Star Trek. Way to uh, go, Jake. Jeez. <laughs> get out of here, amateur. Uh, I, I got to get it right. Um, yes, when, when, the, when the original motion picture came out, and uh, you learn at the end that V'ger, the whole movie, was actually Voyager, and that the Voyager missions had actually recently been launched uh, before the picture came out. Yeah. Um, and, and I hear, you know, from, from my mom, who, who was a big Trekkie, uh, that it was very exciting for everybody, you know, at the time, because, I mean, the Voyager missions wait, wait, just that's happened. Awesome. Your mom is a Trekkie? That, so, that's awesome. Yeah, oh, absolutely. My, my, yeah, mom, my mom is, mom too. My mom took me to see the new Star Trek. <laughs> I, I mean, were, were you around to see that, the, the, the ending of the motion picture, and how'd you feel about that? Okay, so first, uh, just to remind people, in case they hadn't seen it or they weren't born yet, the, the, the most Star Trek, the motion picture, which is what have resurrected the entire crew from the original series, uh, that that sort of reintroduced this whole sort of grand uh, storytelling, large palette mission statement to a to a new generation, and, and and that was great. In there, they folded in the fact that there's this Voyager spacecraft that visited the planets with a mission to explore and to get as much information as it can about these objects. What distinguished Voyager from other, many other missions is that it had enough energy to escape the gravitational uh, embrace of the sun wow. and would, uh, would leave the solar system and go journeying throughout the galaxy. 
And so that was, the, and Carl Sagan knew that, and his collaborators, and so they affixed to the side of Voyager messages in case that craft was, was captured and analyzed by intelligent aliens elsewhere in the galaxy. So this movie folded Voyager into its plot line by recognizing that Voyager did go across the galaxy and did find out all knowledge there was in the universe and was coming back one, waiting for its next instructions. But <laughs> what concerns me about that is, like, <laughs> why do they call it V'ger? Well, because the craft, some of the, the O-Y... Uh, a couple of letters rusted over, yeah. and so it was just V and some rust, and then G E R. So it called <laughs> itself V'ger. V'ger, yeah. And what worry, what concerned me is if this craft discovered all the information in the universe and was coming back for more, you think it would have known its own name? <laughs> Seriously, yeah. it would have, would point, have wiped yeah. the dust off at some point. Yeah. Well, what's up with the rust? You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's right. Funny. I never thought of that. Here's something people may not know about you. Just to shift gears for a second, uh, during your time at the uh, University of Texas, uh, you joined the dance team and you study dancing styles such as jazz and ballet and Latin ballroom. Are you still an active dancer? And can you teach me a good dance to break out at my wedding this summer? No, <laughs> what about the move at yeah, your wedding? Yeah, abs- absolutely. Uh, I, I, I did perform in, in three, uh, th- I participate in three performing dance companies. They were college troops, so it's not like I was on Broadway or, or at the Bolshoi. <laughs> right, right. But I was in really great shape at the time, and uh, it's a kind of a conditioning that that you never reach again because it's a strength and agility and flexibility. And so I, I, I long for being in that kind of shape, but when I was dancing, I wasn't writing books. I wasn't, you know, I was so that, it's a chapter of my life that I'm done with, and now I'm creating other chapters. And I find that the people who are sort of most miserable in their adulthood are those who didn't keep inventing new things to do in their lives, and they keep referencing back to their high school prom or to when they were, you know. And so I try to, uh, I, I, I take to heart that line from that tract called Desiderata. I don't know if you remember that. One of the lines so, in yeah. it, it says, take kindly the counsel of the years, gracefully surrendering the things of youth. So I've been, uh, people asked me if I wanted to like go on Dances with the Stars. It said it'd be fun, but then I wouldn't be doing this other. And I'm exactly, not doing. Yeah. I'm trying to get the universe out right now. So you let others take, to us. take on that mantle. You wouldn't be on talking here to WCUR right now. Exactly. I, you know. <laughs> yeah. I also read that you were involved with uh, wrestling and rowing during your college years. Yes, yes, and I was an so, uh, avid athlete in those in each of those. And and uh, and I was just at a wrestling match. My my college. Uh, came into town to to wrestle uh, to Harvard wrestle Columbia, oh, and wow. so it's fun when I'm there watching it because you know my muscles feel it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody gets into some kind of headlock or something, and yeah. then I get a crick yeah. in my neck, and then you yeah. know. So it's, I I totally love it vicariously, but I'm not getting back out there on the mat. Is there anything you're not awesome at? <laughs> How, how's your karaoke? <laughs> how's your stamp collecting at this point? <laughs> I'm just assuming you collect everything in the universe, including intelligence. Is that why you have conferences? You just get a room full of fantastically intelligent people and suck the intelligence out of them? Is that how you accomplish your great you finally achievements? figured out my plot. Yeah, you're right. an intellectual vampire, sir. I'm calling you out. Um, no, there are things I do. I mean, if, I re- if I'm really interested in something, I think you should try to be as, as good as you can at yeah. it. And if I give a quick example, uh, um, I was just on, on Jon Stewart last night, and... Oh, cool. You, you follow you follow John Stewart up with John Stewart up with us. That's awesome. I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. What a great and, opener uh, for us. There are people that say to me, uh, "Oh, you're such a natural there with him," and they have no idea yeah. how much effort I put into to anticipate statements he might make, current events yeah. he might bring into the fold, and there's a huge mental exercise going on. And there, you've seen people at these interviews with Stephen Colbert or Jon Stewart, where it's like they're deer in the headlights, you know? Yeah. They, 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 or they get, it, they get aced by, by uh, questions that just whiz mm-hmm. right by them. Right. And I'm saying, if I'm going to be on the show, let me be as best as I can be. And so I studied them, and I said, what is the rhythm of his questions? And what, how deep into the news cycle does he reach for random stuff that has nothing to do with what I'm saying yeah. and plant it in front of me to get me to react? So... <laughs> So I try. So I work at it, and maybe not enough people try to be as good as they can be about all the things they find themselves engaged in. How is it that you, of your intellectual ability, have this power to convey such complex intellectual situations and even the solution to the situation into layman's terms, so that people who have no idea what you're talking about get it just like that? 
Uh, yeah, th- thanks. The, I would say it's not that I translate or dumb down, or yeah. it's that it's I arrange the words in a way that are accessible to people who haven't previously had the occasion to think about it. And that arrangement of words and concepts is not necessarily the way you would learn that same subject in a classroom leading towards a homework set or an exam. And not only that, I spend some part of my day plugging into pop culture. I watch every minute of the Academy Awards, and I watch every minute of the Super Bowl. I'm, I'm sort of like football, but not as much as most people who like football. Yeah. But I watch it because now I can draw from pop culture references, if necessary, when I'm speaking about the laws of physics or the frontier of space exploration or, or, or strong. I can, I'm pretty fluent with movies. We all love movies. Yeah. We, let's talk about you know the movies and and i have colleagues who don't go to the movies or who or who 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 chide any effort that they might have to invest in in meeting someone halfway and I, i'm saying i'm not even going to meet you halfway i'm going to be in your living room talking about this mm-hmm. because i it's my judgment that if i'm an educator it's my responsibility to find you it's not your responsibility to find me exactly. and this is what drives my efforts you, you know, I, and I, I hate to I hate to do this to you, Doctor Tyson, but I know we're we're running out of time here. We're we're almost at the end of the interview. But my roommate Phil has a serious gripe with you about Pluto, and I I, argue, <laughs> I, argue, I get over it. That's what I told him. I, I, I honestly I've told him for the past couple of days. He wanted me to ask you a question about Pluto, but honestly, I just I think you just summed it up. If you could just say to him right now, Phil, get over it. Could you do that for me? <laughs> <laughs> Would that be okay? Okay, Phil, get over it. No, but but I have but the reason for it. I mean, I th- let me give Absolutely. him the best reason. How about the best reason, okay? Okay. Yes. If the planet Neptune were the size of a Chevy Impala parked on the curb, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, Neptune is, is, you know, four or five times bigger than Earth. It's a little bit bigger than Earth. Mm-hmm. If, if, if a Chevy Impala were analogized to Neptune, you can ask, well, how big is Pluto compared to that? It's the size of a matchbox car on the curb. Wow. wow. It's not the size of a Mini Cooper or a VW Beetle. It is a matchbox car. So Pluto, wow. and plus it's more than half ice by volume, bring it to where Earth is right now, heat from the sun would evaporate that ice. It would grow a tail. <laughs> we have words for things with tails in the solar system. They're called comets. So mm-hmm. you just weigh all this evidence, and Pluto really doesn't, have a leg to stand on. I don't, I don't think so. Jake's, Jake's got one more question yeah. for you, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I was just wondering, you know, as a music lover myself, I'd like to know, what's on Neil deGrasse Tyson's iPod? Like, what, the, what, what gets you pumped during the day? I have really odd mix of stuff, uh, but if I had to pick one genre that always calls to me, it's the blues. Yes! Nice. Yes. Oh, yes. Tyson, you just made my day. That's oh. fantastic. The, the, okay, the cool. depth of emotion, the depth of emotion captured by good blues artists I think that is music at its finest, reaching into your soul and twisting it and turning it. And my favorite blues lyric of all time is, honey, if I never see you again, that's too soon for me. (laughs) 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 But but I I, I love good classical, bombastic classical. I like uh, like Broadway musicals, uh, show tunes. Uh, I like uh, classic rock. Is what a what a timeless genre that is. And uh, Motown, I take in doses, you know, because yes. I, I get fatigued by it. But I come back to it though every few months. Yeah, that, oh I, I, I do the same thing. I you know I get a little Jackson Five, I get a little love sure. the, uh, Spinners, and then you're like, oh, okay, well now it's time to take a break. Get back. Yeah, it's time to You yeah. got to get deeper then. Absolutely, right. definitely right. Uh, I had one more question for you, uh, Doctor Tyson. Um, okay, I'm a recently okay. graduated uh, geology student. Is there any words of advice that you could give me to keep me inspired to keep going in the scientific fields? Yeah, uh, so uh, geology, you know, is, is, when I think of geology, I think of Earth as but one example of geology. Yeah. There's, there's enormous frontiers waiting for the attention of geologists in the surfaces of the moon, of Mars. So when I think of the frontier of geology, I'm not really thinking Earth. I'm thinking every other rocky place in mm-hmm. the solar system and in the galaxy. I'm tired of going away from natural disasters, much of which are geologically driven. It's, you know, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes. Yeah. I, I wait for the day where geologists figure out 
how to tap the energy from a volcano. We, we tap oh, kegs. Yeah. That's going to be so let's awesome. Stick, put a spigot in the side of a volcano. <laughs> tap that energy. Drive the energy needs of the city that would otherwise be leveled by the lava ready to spill from it. And then that reduces the pressure from inside. It doesn't blow, and everybody benefits. The whole world's counting on Greg, I guess. <laughs> I think, yeah, we all have Greg on our shoulders here. Dr. Tyson, thank you again very much. My guest today, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. You can go pick up his book, The Space Chronicles, Facing the Ultimate Frontier. It is out now. Go pick it up. Thank you very much, Dr. Tyson. We appreciate thank you having on. Thank, thank you very much. Have a good day. As a little footnote to this entire story, this interview, um, Sam and I actually went to a live event with Neil deGrasse Tyson and Hershey in 2017, and I was actually one of the last people that got to ask him a question during the live show, and I referenced this interview, and well, here you go. Yes, hey, Dr. Tyson. I had the, uh, the great pleasure of interviewing you on the college radio show in 2012 in Westchester, and it was amazing. It was Whoa! The best ever done. Yeah, oh, I'm pleased that I agreed. What was yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, just quickly, sure. there are people who, like, who have podcasts, of which there are many, they'll send me a note to request that I appear on their podcast, and they think that they're more likely to get me if they give the list of famous people that have previously been on the podcast. And I just don't care. <laughs> I just care if you have energy to do this, and you've got ambition, and then I'm there. So I'm glad I... I it I wasn't, I wasn't sure that Van Margera was going to really impress you all that much. So, <laughs> <laughs> so my question I asked you then too, my roommate at the time had a huge grief, uh, like a break with you about Pluto. He was really pissed about it. Get over it. That's <laughs> 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 the same thing you said then. Take I that, Greg. If people still give you grief about Pluto and if you still take it to go from anybody that you Yeah, because those who know my history may know that Wait, was anyone here dragged here by the person next to them? <laughs> a few of you? Yeah, I mean, you have no idea who I am or what I've done or anything, so welcome. I get a little taste of it. But those in the know remember that 15 years ago, I was in the middle of the debate about the demotion of Pluto. And while I was not responsible for it, I got blamed by most people because in New York, at the facility that I run, and when we newly designed it, Pluto was reorganized away from the rest of the eight and put with dirty ice balls in the outer solar system. <laughs> and the New York Times caught wind of this and had a page one story. Pluto not a planet, only in New York. And that's when the hate mail started coming in from third graders. Okay? Oh, no. And now those third graders are like grown up with other priorities, so I think they're done. And new third graders know about Pluto's issues from the beginning. So there's a there's a generation kind of in between that's still a little bit pissed off. And all I can say is Pluto had it coming. Get over it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Tell that to your friend. Oh, one, one quick thing. There was one I have a letter, I have to dig it up, where a kid didn't want me to devote Pluto and called me a poo-poo head. <laughs> <laughs> when that kid became 21, he wrote to me, dead to hand letter, says, uh, Dear Dr. Tyson, um, when I was six years old, I wrote you a letter calling you a poo-poo head for devoting Pluto. I have since researched the question and I've come to agree, agree entirely with your decision. I apologize for the pain you might have felt. So thanks again for tuning in today to this uh, special episode. Again, I know it's a little bit different than what we usually do, and it's a little bit shorter as well. But, uh, you know, try not to try not to stress too much. You know, try not to lose the faith. We're going to get through this. It sucks right now, but it, you know, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. And hopefully this is just a lot faster than they're saying it's going to be. Uh, so we will see you again, hopefully in a week, maybe two weeks. We'll see. Whenever we have some content to give you, we'll put it out there and we'll let you know. So uh, stay safe. You know, don't forget to wash your fucking hands. And we'll, uh, we'll see you again soon. Foundation Radio is produced and recorded by Adam Barnard and Sam Kreps. Our intro music is Ugly by Dumb Ugly. Our outro music was recorded by Jason Sylvester and Carl Pinnell. Special thanks to Greg Mead, Joe Keen, and Jeff Quinn. 
Leave a five-star rating and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Foundation underscore radio. Find us on Facebook at Foundation Radio Pod. This has been a Foundation Radio production. 